All right. So next topic is about deployment use cases. So cool, I upgraded my router. I do have SD-WAN capability on ISR4K, but how can I use it? First very simple example or use case is to have just one router at the branch. In this case, you have WAN H, which is, let's say, ISR 4K running as DVAN image, and it is connected to internet and MPLS transport. Yeah. Nothing special, you're doing just a standard SDVAN interaction. Not, it's just a different model type, but it will operate exactly in the same manner as uh, DH1000, for example. Of course, you have legacy size, means non SDVAN, and probably you want to interconnect or you have to uh, communicate between SDVAN side and non SDVAN side. That's basically the main question how shall I do this? As I mentioned, SDVAN communication is straightforward. For example, you have this. Uh, ISR4K talking to data center or remote center side, just a standard OMP communication, nothing special. But what's about this side? This router is a legacy router. Um, well, it will not understand OMP. So the question is, how can I exchange prefixes? Or how, how can I talk from this non-SD, non-OMP router to this one edge to the ISR4K. The communication basically will go through the data center side. So there is no direct way to go from ISR4K directly to this legacy non-SD band side. That will flow through the data center and remote side. So I guess this is the case where you had an existing site that was a legacy site, so to speak, right? You converted it, so now it's an SD-WAN site, right? And now it participates in the SD-WAN fabric, so it has this OMP interaction and subsequently the IPsec tunnels between the members of the fabric. But then you talk to the legacy site, which you haven't converted yet, and you're saying the recommendation is go through a data center. Yes, and basically the next step will be to upgrade this router. Right. So ideally it will be the same ISR 4K, right. where you can do the upgrade, as we mentioned before and install a Steven router or a Steven image here. So then it will be a part of your Steven fabric and then you can use the whole Steven feature set across two routers. Sure. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So next use case is what if I have two different routers? In the first, in the previous slide we have just one. ISR4K, which we converted to sd -Vans. In this case, I have two routers. And one option shown here is it's really device-level redundancy where you have each router connected to both transports. Router on the left side is connected to, to the internet and also to MPLS at the same time. If you want to save circuit costs, you can use the feature we call TLOC extension, which is simply say a transport extension. So you'll be using a cross links or LAN link in order to extend internet to another router and do the same for MPLS. That's why you see here two different colors. So you see the blue, which is representing the internet it gets extended to the second router. And the same is done for MPLS. It is extended to router number one. This case is about branch where you have two routers and one of them is in SD-WAN that can be ISR 4K with all SD WAN feature capabilities. And the second router, for example, is running unified communication, which is currently not supported on the SD WAN image. 
So for UC, for unified communication, you will need this router, which is also connected to MPLS. So here is the question, what is the traffic flow for SD-WAN and non-SD-WAN traffic in this particular use case? If you have SD-WAN traffic flow, then basically it flows to the Cisco router doing UC, then it cross to the left, it goes to the WAN edge doing SD-WAN feature set, and then basically it goes all the way up to data center or to different peers. Mm -hmm. So that's the traffic flow for SD-WAN traffic. One important point to highlight is no direct advertisement between MPLS and non-SD-WAN uh, router. This looks a little bit more complicated. David, any questions, any remark you want to m do here? Because uh, it's, it's really tricky if you have SD-WAN and non-SD-WAN at the same yeah. time. Uh, the way I'm looking at that is um, if I had a site that has um, an existing Cisco router and it has a certain functionality that is not supported mm -hmm. for SD-WAN. So what are my options? I'm trying to sort of adopt SD-WAN and I have this functionality that is not supported. So I cannot take, just like you said, with the, with the configuration tool and with the support metrics, right? I can't just take an existing router that runs feature set that, I, that we don't support yet on SD-WAN, but I still want SD-WAN. So the way I'm looking at what, uh, what you described is the way I would uh, look at that is that you leave your existing router in place mm -hmm. because you have no choice. You have to keep it because you need this feature. If you really don't need this feature, then that's a separate conversation. <laughs> but if you really must have this feature, um, then you leave that router alone, and, and that's your non-SD-WAN router that has to stay in the branch. Um, and then you put a, an additional router from the choices that we had, and you can, you can select which one is more appropriate for you, and put this side by side, and that is your SD-WAN router, which does all your SD-WAN work, but then your existing router is not just leverage for a functionality that is not supported for SD-WAN, because I'm also seeing that green line that actually crosses from the WAN edge over the existing um, Cisco SD-WAN router to provide you connectivity to an existing transport, such as, such as an MPLS, right? So the way I interpret your drawing is basically I can add on an SD-WAN functionality in the corner cases where a certain feature or a certain piece of hardware is not supported, yet I would like to move to SD-WAN. So I leverage this solution where standing up an SD-WAN intelligence side by side and still leveraging all of the transport. Right, and then basically you have also a roadmap discussion about features which, which are not r available on the left on the SD-WAN side right now. Right. So you will try to work with uh, Cisco and say, well, this is what I need to be supported on a Steven side, and we have a roadmap. One example, very popular example, is EIGRP. Right now, we don't support EIGRP on the LAN side. Yes, you can do OSPF redistribution. That's not a problem at all. So you can work around this, and that's fine. But if you need EIGRP, right now you cannot do this. So that's a roadmap item. We have one example of this kind of discussions and features um, you talked about. Sure, yeah. And one more thing that I also noticed that when you have um, this no advertisement, right? Um, so it makes sense to me because if you start really looking at the details of how the routing information is distributed around, um, some of it is distributed through the OMP, which is the overlay information. Some of it is distributed through the traditional routing protocols such as OSPF or BGP um, that I may have relationship with my service provider. So that interaction between the two protocols at every single branch that I'm converting um, could create issues, right? Anybody who has operated routing domains that have to interface with each other, and at the end of the day, SD-WAN is a routing domain of a sort, a really smart routing domain, an SDN routing domain, but it is a routing domain. So having this interoperability between overlay and, and underlay at every single 
um, branch location can result in the fact that you're actually creating loops. And in fact, if you're not careful with filtering and things like that, you can become, every single branch office can become a transit site for overlay to underlay interoperability. So I agree with you uh, what you showed uh, you know, on this slide and on the previous slide that preventing this conversation with an underlay at every single branch office removes the human factor um, from fat fingering things, not configuring filters properly, mm -hmm. um, that would result in branch offices taking over this overlay underlay routing, which will be disastrous. And we have use cases that people have tried that, have done that, and if they're not careful enough, they could create an issue. So I, sure. I fully agree with you that doing this in a control fashion through data centers or through regional hubs in a more predictable fashion is much more, um, much less prone to human error than if you were to do this in every single branch. So, yeah. okay. so I agree. And I think that just shows the point that we, uh, the interoperability is through the data centers. Exactly, that was yeah. exactly this discussion about non SD-WAN Right. Conversation. Yeah. And everybody, I guess everybody's going to have this non SD WAN, right? Because you can't transition your network, big or small, you can't transition this in a day, right? It's not a cutover. You don't just cut over your entire network. So you have to make sure that you go through the cycles of planning and really thinking this through when you take this process of moving into SD WAN. Uh, I know we said that the upgrade process of a device is fast, right? I think um, 15 minutes or so? Yes, 15 minutes for the reboot and yeah. some stuff. But yes, it will take some time for pre-provisioning, for preparation. It's not something which you do. I'm talking about the migration of the network right. in one day. Absolutely. Right, exactly. And the same was uh, basically with complex scenarios where you have non sd event side and sd event side. Right. Last, um, last message on the use cases and RSXE is a white paper we created and you see the contents here. So we start with introduction, we list requirements, we talk about use cases and we describe a lot of details how to uh, deal with specific use cases um, we just briefly touched. Right. Then we have licensing, we have operational aspects. It's all written, I would say it's about 18 to 20 uh, pages uh, white paper list posted on CCO describing specifically this topic, as even on iOS XE based routing. Sure, I, I guess that's important, right? Because it's um, it's not just about upgrading a single device, right? I really like that uh, you know that you guys call that an end-to-end -end view because it is really an end-to-end -end view. Okay, well, thank you very much, Nikolai, for uh, taking us through this exciting topic, right? So in this session today, we focused on running Cisco SD-WAN on the iOS XE routers. We talked about how the power of Cisco SD-WAN software can be leveraged on the ISR 1K, ISR 4K, ASR 1K platforms, um, as, as well as the virtualized platforms such as ENCS and uh, uh, some uh, deployment in the public cloud. Right. So we really talked about that. We really talked about how you can uh, take this upgrade process and the steps you need to perform this upgrade process and the uh, PNP portal and the communication with an SD-WAN uh, elements, how we perform the conversion of an existing configuration uh, of the um, Cisco IOS 6 router to making sure that it's compatible with the, the SD-WAN uh, configuration and flagging the things that need to be fixed before the, um, the router can be successfully converted into the uh, IOS XE SD-WAN um, image. We touched briefly upon licensing uh, which is an important consideration. And lastly, we talked about the different deployment use cases with an existing, uh, converting an existing router as an in-place upgrade for one router or as an option to have two router option where uh, certain features are not yet supported by the SD-WAN. So hope you enjoyed this video and have a great day.